Vamos a escuchar a, al profesor H. Nuana, H. Nuana, como director ejecutivo de Dynamic Spectrum Alliance. H. Nuana ayuda con el desarrollo y ejecución de las iniciativas estratégicas de la organización y actividades de divulgación y captación de posibles socios y miembros a través de los sectores público, privado y los sectores sin ánimo de lucro. Antes de unirse a la alianza, Nuana fue director de política de espectro de Ofcom, donde se hizo cargo del grupo política del espectro del Reino Unido y encabezó las actividades de gestión dinámica del espectro del Reino Unido, centrándose específicamente en TV Wide Spaces para banda ancha y otras aplicaciones. Mientras estuvo en Ofcom, Noana fue responsable de multimillonarios proyectos sobre la política, incluyendo el programa de televisión digital en el Reino Unido, el cual concluyó en el 2013. Noana también supervisó la subasta de 4G en el Reino Unido, el cual recaudó miles de millones y concluyó en febrero de 2013. Antes de esto, Noana fue director general de Arquiva y a principios de su carrera trabajó en Cuadriga Worldwide Limitada, donde jugó un papel decisivo en la introducción de la tecnología digital y servicios a la industria de la hospitalidad a través de Europa, Oriente Medio y África. Antes de Cuadriga fue un capitalista de riesgo por dos años y antes un premiado y publicado tecnólogo, siendo de BTPLC durante cinco años. También acaba de publicar un libro autorizado titulado Telecomunicaciones, Medios y Tecnología para las Economías Emergentes. ¿Cómo hacer que las telecomunicaciones, los medios y la tecnología mejoren las economías en desarrollo para la década de 2020? Publicado en abril de 2014. Bienvenido, doctor Noana. I will try and move very fast. I'm really, really honored to be here in, in Colombia. This is my second or third time to be here in Colombia. Uh, but it's fantastic to see the conference that uh, ANE has actually put together. And even better, I must say, I've worked with a lot of ministers in my time, and I thought your minister was fantastic. I thought the minister of ICT in here in Colombia was fantastic yesterday. So well done to him, really, honestly. Um, So I'm, re I'm here really to talk about the Internet of Things and Dynamic Spectrum Access, but I want to share with you some of my biases up front, so some of my prejudices, if, it, if I could call it that way. So I've been a senior spectrum regulator for a big country like the United Kingdom, so I ran the, uh, uh, all of the digital switch over the auction in the United Kingdom last year, which raised $4 billion, etc., for 4G, 3G, 2G. So I've, I've been responsible for licensed spectrum, and I'm very passionate that more licensed spectrum gets out in the marketplace. I'm also very passionate now about working for Africa. A lot of what I do right now uh, is trying to connect the next two to three billion who are not connected. A lot of them exist in Africa, in parts of Asia like India, and in China. Some in Latin America, but I really want to concentrate, I'll try and tell you about the African story in some of what uh, I tell you today. And then thirdly, I'll talk about Dynamic Spectrum Alliance because as somebody who has been a practicing regulator for four or five years, I can promise you that in 10 years' time, we really need to be thinking about the way we allocate spectrum in a dynamic way. I think I've got this very strong view that if we take all the engineers in this room and give them a blank sheet of paper to say, design how we should do the next generation spectrum allocation and spectrum assignment, approaches, it will be in a much more dynamic way than what we have got today. And it's very interesting to see one of the posters outside. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple. One of the posters outside talked about the spectrum scanning here in Bogota. And the reality is what we see all the time. We heard from Ericsson quite rightly before, saying we need something between three to five times more spectrum in the mobile domain. I used to get all of those sort of feedback all the time coming from industry when I was a regulator at Ofcom. All the time. And they are right. But at the same time, we must be honest to say, as that poster out there says it very clearly, that most of the spectrum is not being used in most of the places most of the time. That's just a fact. Right? If you do not believe me, go out to the poster out there to see the usage of spectrum 
here in Bogota in one of the, uh, the posters out there. And for the avoidance of doubt, that poster will get my vote. Okay. Um, so I want to come from that perspective. So if I were to, is it this fourth button? The green one. The green one. The green, okay. Where am I pointing? Yeah. This big green one, okay. So let me just introduce you to the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance. So I'll talk uh, first and foremost about what we are, about the DSA, uh, a bit about Dynamic Spectrum Access, the case for it. And I'm really going to make the case, particularly from Africa and some of the emerging markets, some of these two to three billion people who have not been connected. Last month I was in China. Um, and then lastly, it's talking about, as an X-Spectrum regulator, how a regulator like Ofcom looks at something like the Internet of Things. But obviously, I don't speak for Ofcom anymore. Okay. So the DSA really is a global organization. We only set up about a year ago. The reason I decided to take that on for myself, really, to run the organization, is because of my experience having been a regulator to see what I said, how inefficiently sometimes we use, we use spectrum. So I'm really, really passionate as an ex-regulator to drive more efficient use of spectrum. And our, our, our members are really in the vein trying to do just that. So that's really a very short summary of the, of the DSA. The goals really are very simple, to close the digital divide. And I'll give you a concrete example in Africa about what that means. Because sometimes when we talk about closing the digital divide, it sounds theoretical. But in practice, there's some really difficult, challenging problems to connect a continent like Africa. And permit me to give you, to use the example of my continent. I come from Africa originally. I come from Cameroon, uh, to give you that example. Second, to enable the Internet of Things. I can assure you that when our predecessors, the spectrum regulators of 1914, were designing spectrum allocation practices, they did not think of Internet of Things. <laughs> right. They certainly did not think of Internet of Things. Uh, so the new next generation of people who are thinking about spectrum regulation certainly have to think about that. And then lastly, exactly what you heard from both GSMA and from Ericsson, there is an artificial spectrum crunch to some degree created by the way we allocate spectrum today, leading to this situation where spectrum is not being used in most of the places most of the time. So we've got lots of current members. We've just got people like Broadcom joined the organization recently. So we're very pleased about that. So let me just start by asking the question dynamic spectrum access. And this is one of the reasons why I personally, even though I'm a big supporter of 4G and a big supporter of 3G and all the GSMA ecosystem, and I'm also a big supporter of unlicensed access, why people like me in a senior regulatory position were also looking at dynamic spectrum access. So what is it? Um, but before I do that, let me just give you some of my key messages just in case I run out of time. My key messages are the following. That in the 2020s, I would like to think that the, we should start thinking about dynamic spectrum access more as a norm rather than an exception. More as a norm. It should not be the case that in 10, 15 years' time, we are sitting in a room here and we still have the same allocation practices for spectrum as we had in 1914. Secondly, emerging economies like mine Africa need dynamic spectrum access, and we need it sooner. And I'm going to make that case to you today. And even developed economies need it too, in order to support things like Internet of Things. I'm also going to argue that it's good for the regulator and the government. It's good for network economics, because network economics drives our industry. I know that because I used to run a lot of companies in the industry. It's good for competition, and it's also good for entrepreneurs. So what is dynamic spectrum access? In a very simple form, it is all about a spectrum sharing approach that allows secondary users access to abundant spectrum holes or white spaces. So sometimes when you hear about white spaces, people just think about it as just TV white spaces. There's white spaces everywhere across the spectrum bands. Okay? There's white spaces everywhere along the spectrum bands. So it's, a, it's, a secondary, it's an approach which allows for secondary users to have access to these spectrum holes in these white spaces in licensed spectrum bands. And you would have expected it to be my responsibility as a senior spectrum regulator who has the, the, the duty
to drive up spectrum efficiency, to ensure that we, look, we, we also try and see how we use those white spaces. So that's the reason we did it, or that's the reason I was doing it. And today, DSA, DSA technology al allows radios to safely share multiple frequency bands without interfering with one another. A lot of our radio devices already, already have multiple radios, multiple radios in it, and are able to coexist pretty well within the same radio device. So inevitably, what dynamic spectrum access leads to is sharing. And as you heard from this conference already, there is unlicensed sharing, like in the case of Wi-Fi. It's good. There's license sharing, license of shared access. I did all of that in the UK. All of the program making and special event which we use for the Olympics in the United Kingdom, I was also responsible for the spectrum policy for that. It's all effectively licensed shared access. So sharing is no longer the preserve of the unlicensed only. Because today, a lot of times, we think about sharing only for, license, only for licensed bands. But regulators are now increasingly beginning to think about sharing for licensed bands as well. Geolocation models. So you can now use ge ge geospatial databases or geolocation databases to be able to tell you which frequencies are available in what locations. And in the long term, we're going to use cognitive, uh, cognitive sensing models because the technology is increasingly allowing you to be able to do that. And so TV white spaces is just using geolocation in the TV bands. But in the United States now, the United States is already thinking about using a similar geolocation model in 3.4. In the UK, we're thinking about using in 3.4 and 2.4. So there are a lot of bands where we are also beginning to look at dynamic spectrum access type techniques using geolocation techniques in the first instance. And in the long term, we start looking at cognitive sensing techniques as well. So the constraints are now really I can tell you that as an ex-regulator, the constraints are now regulation and policy. It's not really technology anymore. And the lead times are short. So I'm not standing here as an ex-regulator pretending that these things happen overnight. It takes a long time for a lot of these spectrum regulations to, to get into place. So as my ex-colleague from, from, uh, from Ericsson spoke about earlier, he mentioned about the fact that it could be five to 10 years. Same message you heard from Huawei. And if you want to be able to get three to five times the amount of spectrum for mobile, you may just want to consider also using dynamic spectrum type approaches. If the, the way the regulations work across the world is not going to deliver that amount of spectrum in this short amount of time. And I can tell you that in my continent, we can't wait. We cannot wait for that amount of time. And I've spoken to a lot of ministers on my continent where we really have to look at a way to connect the continent as quickly as possible. So you can look, if you just look at typical uh, TV bands, you can see the classic signatures there for analog TV. You can see the classic signatures for digital TV. And you can see a lot of white spaces. And if you go around Bogota, you'll see exactly the same thing as I saw on the poster out there. And the idea is why should you allow these licensed bands to lay fallow when they can also be used to drive up spectrum efficiency? So this is a classic case in the United Kingdom where I was responsible for. And you can see this, is, I think this was Channel 34. Channel 34, you can see it's used around the whole Wales region. It's used around the London, greater London region. And it's used around Manchester. But it's not used anywhere else. So it's a white space. Channel 34 is now a white space in all the rest of the United Kingdom not being used. And you can see that by introducing some TV white space broadband, as long as it doesn't interfere with the primary user, i.e. broadcasting, then any serious regulator should really seriously think about uh, legislating and allowing for that. Because you can see that these devices are running at five watts, one watt, 100 milliwatts. It's certainly not going to interfere with any of the primary users. And so that you can see a secondary access to spectrum by secondary users whilst not taking into consideration. Uh, it drives off spectrum efficiency. Key, key for any operator, you, you protect the incumbent licensee. You do not in any way, way shape, or form want to interfere with the, inter, in, in, with the licensee, which is broadcasting. And for sometimes when you hear TV white spaces are already being used uncontroversially in the UK, for example, and in many other countries, by other services. PMSC, program making and special events, wireless microphones, wireless cameras, are already sharing spectrum on a secondary basis 
in the broadcasting sector, in the broadcasting bands. And same thing, my colleagues and myself also licensed a lot of local TV channels last year in the United Kingdom in some of the TV bands. So it is not something that should be that controversial. So again, that's what white space are. So I've talked about that. It's not only in the TV bands, it's across. So that's a classic CPT definition of, TV white, of, of white space. Part of spectrum available for radio communication at any given time, geographical location, on a non-interfering, non-protected basis with regard to the primary user and other services. Uh, why are they interesting? From a spectrum pers uh, uh, per regulator's perspective, most of us have a duty to secure optimum use of spectrum. That's why people like me kicked off projects like this in the United Kingdom. We also have duties to remove barriers to innovation. One of the key reasons I did this in the United Kingdom as well was to drive innovation, to ensure that companies come into the United Kingdom who want to produce new radios, generate IPR in these sort of new areas. And we in the United Kingdom always saw TV white spaces as a stepping stone for future access in other bands. It was always a stepping stone for future access, dynamic access in other bands. Because we believe passionately, and my colleagues in Ofcom still do, uh, that it is important for us to really drive up spectrum efficiency. And one of the ways to drive up spectrum efficiency in the long term is to look at the whole concept of dynamic spectrum access. So let me give you some core reasons why this is quite important. We do it, and we do it very quickly. So this is a classic. Uh, um, so this is a classic reason why any good regulator talks about. So Julie men mentioned this earlier. Any good regulator ultimately is there to drive up the interest for their consumers and citizens. So the Canadian regulator is there to drive up the interest for the Kenyan, for the Canadians, uh, consumers and citizens. Me in the UK was for the Cameroonians, for the British consumers and citizens. It is not there for big industry. So sometimes when I used to have fights with big industry, I used to have to explain to them carefully that ultimately we as regulators make decisions for the benefits of the consumers and citizens of, in this case, and of this beautiful country, for example, of Colombia. That's why they're there. That's why you drive competition. You come up with policies to drive competition, to drive quality, to help to drive innovation, and all of that sort of good stuff. So you can see that in the UK, we actually measure the, the contribution of spectrum to the UK economy. And you can see in 2005, 2006, it was something like 36, 37 billions, that contribution, that spectrum made to the UK economy. And you can see that our spectrum director here, I was the group director of spectrum policy at that time, by 2011, it went up to 53 billion. Now that my team and myself, we did all the 4G auctions and we did all the digital switchover, we concluded all of that in 2012. I think if we measure this now, it will be somewhere around the figure of 73 billion. So there's a real key measurement for how you're trying to drive up uh, uh, benefits to the UK consumers and citizens, which you can see in that curve. And if you look at how we attained that between 2006 and 11, you can see that public mobile communications went up from 21 billion to 30.2 to 30 .2 billion. And this was before we put out any more spectrum in the market, because the 3G spectrum happened in the UK in 2000. So we did not really put out any big significant spectrum into the marketplace until what, last year when I did it in 2013. So you can see, and it's still increased by 9 billion, by 16%. So you can see that if you measure now, now that we have now got 4G spectrum across the whole United Kingdom, that number would have gone up. You can see the case of Wi-Fi, which did not exist at all in 2006, is now contributing something like 1.6 billion, 1.8 billion to the UK economy. And that number would have gone up. And it goes to some of the reasons why we were driving things like 802.11 uh, AF, because it's also going to use the TV bands, and it's likely to also drive up that particular number. So this is, these are real private benefits to the UK economy. And you can see in the case of microwave links, it actually went down. Can anybody guess why the number went down from 3.9 to 3.3 over that period? Any guess? Fiber. So there was key competition from fiber, which, which, uh, which is a substitute for microwave links, and so it went down in the United Kingdom. And so you can see we are actually measuring the contributions of spectrum. And dynamic spectrum access is going to contribute to that line. There's going to be an IoT line item there in the, in the, next, in the near future, driving up 
uh, uh, contributions to the UK economy. So that's reason number one. Good economic regulation requires you to do, to do that. Reason number two, this is a very important piece of data from organizations like GSMA and from a lot of the mobile operators. And this is a big problem in Africa for us. Typically, if you've got, take for example my country, Cameroon, it's got something like 2,000 sites or 3,000 sites. Typically, most of those operators will get 50% of their revenues from 10% of the sites. So if you've got 1,000 sites, 100 of those sites would be printing 50% of your revenues. Something like 80% of your revenues come from 30% of your sites. And the last 50% of your sites only give you 10% of your revenue. You can see from any business perspective, and I used to run business like this, that's a problem. And what this means in a continent like Africa where 70% of Africans live in rural areas, rural areas, not urban areas. In my country, for example, the top 10 cities are only 28% of the population. Same in Nigeria, and that's the most populous country on the, on, on, on the continent. That's a really big problem, because it means that the likelihood is that the economics of networks are only going to go to about 30% of the population. And we're already seeing that. We're already seeing that on the African continent, particularly for broadband. We're already seeing that. Some of the slides said that this morning. And that's a big issue, because if 70% of the population is living in the rural areas, and the economics only takes you to 30%, where, are we, where is the 70% of rural Africans ever going to get broadband? How are they going to do it? And this is the sort of analysis that any good regulator in their own specific geography should be able to do before they make decisions for the benefits of their consumers and citizens of their countries. So in the United Kingdom, we were able to impose on one of the licenses, on one of the 4G licenses, we imposed a 4G coverage obligation to 98% of the population of the United Kingdom. So one of the 4G licenses, which Telefonica O2 won in the United Kingdom, has an obligation to roll out a 4G network to 98% of the coverage of the population. I can't think of any single African country, or frankly, most Latin American countries who can do that. I can't think of one. And that's a big problem, that graph. And it's something that a lot of African regulators and African decision makers, and it applies to India. I was in India two weeks ago. It applies to some other parts of China that a lot of people are beginning to get up to think about some of the implications of it. And you look at Africa on a map, you typically see the African maps looks at that. So look at that in combination with that. But this is the real problem, this is the real size of Africa. You can fit in all of the United States, you can fit in all of India, you can fit in all of Western Europe, all of Argentina, all of China, some islands, and there will still be one million square kilometers to spare. So you can actually fit in, because Colombia is around 1.14, I checked this morning, square kilometers. You can also fit in Colombia before you, fit, before you close this map. But this is a big problem. You guys, people from the US and from the States, may not realize the implications of this. But let me tell you some of the implications. The implications of this incredible size of the African continent is that there are other countries like, which are big. So let's look at Australia. Australia is big, it's, but 85, Australia only has 23 million people. But most of those Australians, 85% of those Australians live within 50 kilometers of either the West Coast or the East Coast. So you know where to target your mobile networks, okay? You know where to target those networks. Same thing with uh, Canadians. Canada is another very big, big country. There are 34 million people, but most of them live within 150 kilometers of the US border. So you know where to target networks. 64, look, America, it's a very big country. 64% of them live around either the Gulf of Mexico the Pacific area or the Atlantic area. So you know where to target networks. So as you can see, the problem in Africa is that we are very big, we are very rural, and 
the economics of mobile in Af in, from the West, from this diagram, the economics of mobile from here does not quite translate to the economics of mobile on the African continent. It may not matter to you, but if we talk about Millennium Development Goals, about connecting the next two to three billion or the next three to four billion, we must all appreciate this problem. We must all appreciate this problem. Secondly, as I said, all 70% of Africans live in the rural areas. That's a big problem. And the apples are low. Most of the apples in Africa are between four to, six, four to $10. So we've got a triple whammy problem of a massive continent, of it being exceedingly rural, and the apples are very low. So it does not give you enough money to build expansive networks. That's the difficult problem to connect the next three to four billion. That's really the challenge to connect the next three to four billion. <coughs> fixed, there's no fix on the continent. Absolutely no fix whatsoever, right? So I don't need to tell you about that. There's virt virtually no fix on the continent of Africa. So that, this again is GSMA data, as you can see that. Third reason why we need this, we need competition. So some of my friends in the audience from some other companies, you should think about it from the, that I'm presenting this as a regulator. I'm presenting this as these are the options that the ministers in my countries or the ministers in Africa or the ministers in emerging economies who are making decisions for the benefit of their consumers and citizens, they should think about. And competition is a very important one, right? So the broadband problem needs competition from new business models, licensed. I'm a big fan of licensed. That's why I was responsible for auction 4G in the United Kingdom. License exempt and other very hybrid models. We need that. We need fiber, we need satellite. I'm personally responsible for trying to encourage competition from other players to come into the, into the ecosystem from people like Facebook, Google, Spe Spe Spectra Wireless because Facebook do, does not only want to connect the 20% of, the 10% of Cameroonians who are connected to the internet. Facebook also wants to connect the next 90%. Google, does, Google also wants the other 90% of Africans who are not connected to be Googling. And if these guys are prepared to come in and use different models to drive and address the, 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 the broadband problem on the continent, I think it, it behoves of the regulators on the continent and the decision makers on the continent to think about it, to at least think about it to make those decisions. It brings competition from new financial models, Competition from fresh ideas, low-cost models. One of, the, one of the posters earlier talked about low-cost uh, GSM-type models. We absolutely need those in Africa as well, low-cost GSM-type models. And it also creates jobs. Reason four, license exemption is very good. Uh, I won't spend much time on this slide, but just to say, as a regulator, we did a lot of work on the benefits of license exemption. And I'll just give you some data, for example. If this is some data, this guy used to work for me at Ofcom. If we did not have Wi-Fi today, we would have to increase the number of base stations across the globe significantly. Significantly. Because the amount of Wi-Fi of loading, of, of loading data from the main 3G, 4G networks onto Wi-Fi is incredible. In fact, if you do not have Wi-Fi, a lot of people will actually cut off the fixed lines from their home. Because the benefit they get from Wi-Fi, so I gave an example. I was giving a presentation like this in India. And I said, you've got a big screen like this, plasma screen of $1,000, $2,000, US dollars. And your Wi-Fi access point at home, which is only 50 bucks. And I need to take one of those away from you. Right? I need to take away either your Wi-Fi access point or your big screen television costing $2,000. What answer do you think I get? I got. What answer do you think I got? Most people gave away the, uh, the TV very quickly. 95% of the room gave away the TV. But that's because even though the Wi-Fi access point is only 50 to 50 bucks, the, a lot of the value in the Wi-Fi access point is in a broader social value. This is in the value that you can just move around your home it doesn't matter where you are, and you're able to stay connected. You don't actually pay for that from a regulatory perspective. So it's not caught as part of the private value. 
but it is a significant part of what we uh, regulators call the broader social value. And when you regulate as well, you also regulate for good broader social value. You also regulate for good broader social value. In fact, in the most of broadcasting, most of the value in broadcasting is in the broader social value. It's in the fact that two Colombians can watch the same TV program and they can talk about it tomorrow and they can all feel Colombians. It educates, it informs, it gives them news, but people do not necessarily want to pay for that. So a lot of the value is in what we call the broader social value and not necessarily in the private value. So that's another very good reason for license exemption. The, the fifth reason is there are a lot of technologies out there now, principally 802.11af, 802.11ah, 802.22, which can also be used for M2M and Internet of Things. Big companies like MediaTek, Broadcom, are now beginning to produce chip, chipsets in this particular area. You can actually do a lot of address, a lot in Africa to address the broadband problem. I know this because I'm involved in it in my country in Nigeria, by using in fiber, judicious distribution of fiber, along with 802.11af. And 802.11af has been totally ratified already by, by the I, IEEE standards. So we are now beginning to have standards which will actually work in the TV bands. And these continents require that. Six, you can see that in Europe and America, there's a lot of spectrum in mobile hands. In Africa, not much. So people like me go around Africa saying to the regulators, please put out more spectrum to the mobile domain as soon as possible. I'm a big advocate of that. I get very frustrated across Africa when I show them this graph and they do not see this as a responsibility of them, the regulators, to put out more 3G spectrum, 2G spectrum, 4G spectrum. And as you heard from my colleague from DSA, from GSMA earlier, also take away some of the taxes. Taxes is a big problem on the continent, all sorts of taxes that they're using within the, the mobile area. And I don't, I don't like that as well. Uh, so let me just move on. So let's just move now very quickly to IoT and spectrum requirements. So I don't think I'm going to say anything novel here. Everything has been said already. So I'm just going to say a few things. IoT applications are characterized so far by relatively low throughput, low energy consumption for long battery life, low cost of ownership, out of the box type deployments, small volumes of data, very high volumes of connections, et cetera. So in a way, regulators, like myself, I wasn't too worried about it right now because I saw a lot of spectrum out there in the unlicensed bands which you could use to be able to do that. And when I was still a regulator, if you came to me with much better reasons for why we should be looking at more specific bands, then we'll look at it. But as Ofcom, we're always technology neutral, technology and service neutral in terms of the approaches. Uh, but one key thing that is clear, clearly think is, uh, is the fact that it's going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of sharing, my apologies. There's going to be a lot of sharing of the, of, of the bands uh, in, in order to do IoT because of the sheer number of sensors and devices that are talking. And last by no means least, I just want to talk about TV white space and the ITU. So I've taken the, the, the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance into the ITU D, and we are also exploring right now going into ITU R, so the development sector, because for the reasons you can see there, we really need to get ITU blessing and best practice to be able to address more of the problems to connect the next three to four billion, particularly in places like Africa, Asia, Africa, India, and, and, and China. But the good news is that the current regulatory framework uh, actually allows cognitive radio systems and dynamic spectrum access to happen. So this is a direct quote from Director Ransi, a friend of mine. The IT World Regulations Communications Conference of 2012 concluded that the current international regulatory framework can accommodate software-defined radio and cognitive radio systems, hence dynamic spectrum access, without being changed. The development of the systems implementing this concept, such as TV white spaces, is therefore essentially in the hands of national regulators. <coughs> However, as Ransi goes on to say, for this, regulators will depend on state-of-the-art best practices, which are currently developed in ITUR study groups one, five, and six. So that's why I've taken my organization into ITU-D, and we'll also be looking at how we get into ITU-R. So to summarize, I think in five to 10, 15 years time, 
all the spectrum regulators, including a &E, must start thinking about dynamic spectrum access. In 20 years' time, when I'm retiring, it really should become more of the norm to talk about dynamic spectrum access than the exception. We've started it in the TV bands. The United States has already regulated for, for TV white space allocation right now. Singapore has done the same. Some countries in Africa are going to do the same. Ofcom is going to almost certainly do that next year. I was leading that within Ofcom. But that's really because it drives up spectrum efficiency of those particular bands. We are very mindful that we're going to protect the incumbent users. The incumbent users will always be protected. Always be protected, and that's going to be the thing. And then lastly, it would introduce competition. And as you can see from the example from Africa, it is something that you also need to look at different ways to address that problem. Thank you very much. ¿Alguno de ustedes tiene de pronto alguna inquietud? Do I wear a headset? Or? No, you're, you're English. You're English. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Hold on, hold on. It's a very good question. So why don't you... Uh... <clears throat> so uh, my question was, thinking about IoT and thinking about the chart that you showed about um, revenue generation in the first 20% is almost 80%. Um, so obviously mobile networks have obligations about covering people. But IoT business models may be about more geography related. I was wondering if you had any ideas how that curve would change or any other reflections about this. We did some work on this when I was at, at Ofcom, and, but the work was not conclusive enough for me to be able to make a determination. Uh, however, everything I've personally heard from this conference, and I found this Congress exceedingly educative. Tells me that, and I think I heard it from you as well actually, tells me that maybe it's not necessarily the connectivity where it's going to be printing the monies. The, it looks as to me as if in the whole IoT ecosystem, the people who are going to be making the monies are in the people, the process, the systems, the infrastructure. And if you look at it that way, I think it is very important that regulators, and I put my hand up that I didn't spend a lot of time as a regulator talking to the energy industry, talking to utilities, and talking to all these interesting sectors. I think a and &E and my other regulators in the room would have to spend a bit more time talking to those particular sectors in order to understand the sort of economics to the question that you've just asked. Yes, sir. Just a comment, actually, linking, linking your two points. Um, Actually, if you allow dynamic spectrum allocation or spectrum sharing or other models, then you may find other enterprises or other businesses which rely and derive most of the revenue from IoT, but they are in a low populated area, rural, agricultural. And then they can build the infrastructure. So that, you know, that curve. Right. So, so I think we should look also from, from different industries' viewpoint as connectivity becomes a low component, as you said, actually, in, in your presentation. So once you have a low component of connectivity by high value, uh, you have an incentive to build a pipe, to build the... I think you're right. Are you mass? Okay, thank you very much. I've written a lot of my ideas in this book, so feel free to, to, to check that on Google, on Amazon. Thank you very much. Vale, muchas gracias. Thank you.